Hi, everybody. I'm Cindy Allen, Editor-in-Chief of Interior Design, and welcome to Interior Design's Best of Design 2021, a two-week-long online design festival celebrating thought leadership, the best of the best of design, and our collective vision for the future. Now, even though we're not in person again this year, and you know I miss you all oh so much, we'll still be cheering your enormous achievements with our ginormous online crowd. Can you hear them? I can. Oh, and next year, get ready for some real in-person hugs. I promise you that. Today is day three, and here's the best of design lineup for today and next week. We're kicking it off with our Hall of Fame Film Festival, celebrating the greatest minds in our award-winning documentaries. Look at the all-star lineup, and I know you don't want to miss any of them. Then, take a quickie break and join me at three for a festive and thoughtful discussion with an intimate group of my pals and Hall of Famers. A Hall of Fame happy hour, so to speak, and I'll toast to that. And then next week, stay tuned for five full days of the Best of Year Awards, celebrating the best students, people, product, and projects from literally around the globe. And the winners will be announced each day, so it's going to be exciting. I can't wait. Before we get started, I want to give a sincere thanks to all of our 2021 Best of Design Gold sponsors. Thank you, Benjamin Moore. Thank you, Claris. Thank you, Lutron. Thank you, Mohawk. Thanks to the Mart. And thank you, Turf. We couldn't do it without you. And speaking of Turf, everyone knows I love a good accessory. And that includes a fabulous acoustic felt backdrop. And you'll be seeing lots of backdrop changes. Over and over, Turf and their R&D team have proven to be amazing collaborators, creatives, and friends. So when you want to design something custom for your next project, just go to Turf. Now this red beauty, take a look, is straight from their R&D department. Yep, they can literally do anything. Thanks, Turf. So are you ready? Drum roll, please. Get out your popcorn. Hall of Fame day three, let's go. Design is not a strategy, but it is culture. It is something that is on, on, on the road, on the, on the move, it's, uh, it's changing. Sometimes I walk to the city with my daughter, we're walking over one of the bridges and I'm, I'm telling her, just stop for a second, right? look around. This is our city, right? We didn't dig out these canals, we didn't make these bridges, we didn't make these facades. We get all that for free. It's amazing, isn't it? And I really feel that gratitude, and I really feel therefore also that as long as I'm here, I really have to find a way to always have a project for the city to contribute. And so I did a book on the creative history of Amsterdam. I set up a school here in Amsterdam. I made an other book about the works in the Rijksmuseum, and I made this hotel. So it's where the golden age took place. So we recall all kinds of elements that are part of that world. And that is the logo of Amsterdam. I do quite a few different things. I, I do make work that I believe is very near to art, and I do make work that I believe is not very near to art, but is creative in a different way. Marcel Wanders, take me through this. <laughs> Each of these works have character, they have personality, they have soul, and, and they're all 
in a way, portraits of myself, but they wouldn't be interesting if they were only portraits of myself, the portraits of all of us, in a way. It's a little hypnotizing. Yeah. I really love the idea that, you know, I can have different sets of rules for different things that I do. To me, that is the complexity of my life, the complexity of the world. For a lot of people, that's really complicated and very difficult to understand. For me, it's a, it's the, it's a pure essence of who I am. I grew up in uh, a village uh, 100 kilometers south of Amsterdam. Mom and dad had a store there, a household store, but also toys, of course. And there was always little things that broke down, and I was able to take them apart and repair them. But also, I really loved making little gifts. So I, I found maybe a little crystal, drew a face on it, and maybe give it ears, or I put a few things together. I was always found if you give someone something that is unique and made for them. I really got addicted to that. I was, I think, 16 years old, and I wanted to do something creative. And then someone told me about design, and I had no idea what it was. I looked into it and like, oh, I'm making a toaster making a better broom. That's something cool. I think I was the last one that was just able to enter in design school in Eindhoven. And I was the first one out again. Because after a year, they, they expelled me. I really felt it's really important to experiment and to find new ideas. I mean, it was the time of Memphis. I was already talking to the galleries and factories, and I was like, kind of a bit of an outgoing guy. Diversity was super important. There's so many different ways to look at the same object, and I really appreciated all of them. After school, obviously, uh, you set up your own company because nobody wants to hire you. I had already won something like three or four design prizes, and some products were in the collections of companies, but nobody wants to make my products. You're a designer, you want to change the world. And of course, that doesn't happen. And then I made another chair. And so then completely no one believed that I can do a real product that could really sell. I was lucky enough to find Casper Vissers and uh, became a fantastic partner in Moy, a company that would make my products and other people's products. We're entering the world of Marcel Wanders. We have made a podium where we can have people that make no chance anywhere else, and we make them shine. And still today, it's that that I'm most proud of. So I really felt that interior design is, is a logic next step for me. It was so different than what I thought. Product, it needs a good idea, it needs a concept to work. It's like if you have a piece of marble, and you know what's inside, you carve away everything, and you, you have that that thing. Now, if you do that with an interior, you get a really boring interior. Because an interior is different. An interior has a Monday morning, it's Friday night. It's got all these aspects that, you know, products don't have. An interior, therefore, I, I start to understand you designed it as an opera. It's got the flutes, it's got the trombones. It's got the singing, it's got the text, it's got the lights, it's got all these elements. And all of these play a different role at a different moment in, in, in time. So most interiors that we have worked on, they're not here, right? So let's say if we do a hotel in Doha, they want to arrive in Doha. That's where they want to be. And they want to feel that, they want to they experience that. I remember the Mondrian was really spectacular. I think we all published it. Whether it's scale or something quirky or something handmade, you have things that people remember. Every project needs icons. You want people to step into a world and to be mesmerized and to feel the things. So they will be able to express what they have felt because they will recall the icon. It's the evidence of a world. So the, the big challenge always in interior design, besides you know, 
functional details and all kinds of details. But to make something that you feel is representing a, a culture, a place, a locale, yet we want to do something that is also international, yet we want to do something that is also new and not seen before. I mean, that is difficult, but that's our job. I think the way we work in the studio now is, is like something that we've built and crafted for a long time. Since I'm here, we really start to embrace the work and projects in a 360 degrees creative mindset. We don't do just now thinking about the project as design. We think the project in a holistic approach. So we do the project thinking about the photography, the text that goes together, the graphic, the packaging, the advertisement, the art direction, and the video and the animation, we love to really bring our, our, our work and our creations in the, mo in the best way possible. The multidisciplinary way that we work is super important to me. And then to keep free to change everything. For the team, Marcel is, uh, of course, the brilliant mind. is the one that comes into the project and, of course, brings the unexpected aspect on, of his project. People call him designer, interior designer, product designer. I just believe Marcel is the most great creative mind of today in our field. Design is, has become a bit of a big, big animal, right? I mean, when I studied, I thought I am going to do toasters. By now, I want to change design as an idea. We have made a world that's dominated by rationale and technology, we have created the throw side. And I think that's what we have to fight within the context of design. I want to create a world that's, that's more durable, that's more emotional, that's more personal, that's just more romantic, more human. I love listening and trying to understand the client. I love that part. Why did you start this company? What was your idea here? You know, yeah, I know you're gonna change the world with this product, but what were you trying to do? That's gonna help inform what this space is gonna be about. I don't know how we fell into it, but we've always been champions of the workplace. We just wanted to affect where people spent most of their yeah. lives and their day, and now it's, yep. it's the thing. We are lucky to do really, really innovative work with incredibly trusting clients and definitely the best team around. I had no idea that I was signing on to a company that was really going to soar and become a major player in this industry. It's just kind of living the dream right now here in South of Market, right in the heart of it all. It's the first office that we were really able to design for ourselves and, and fix up from scratch. Isn't yeah. that the cutest That's thing? That's so cute. <laughs> What's the dynamic like in the office between the two of you and the staff? Good cop, bad cop, I don't know. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> you can't tell. What do you tell. think? <laughs> bad? <laughs> Absolutely. He's, cheerleader. Yeah, he is motivator, cheerleader, makes everybody. Champion. And I, oh, primo. Champion. <laughs> the champion. The champion of design. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was just the two of us for the first five years. And, and our dog. There were times when Verda and I would work on a deadline by ourselves and we were too tired to go home and we'd just stay in a hotel and then come back in the morning and do that. We were that. doing it all. We were doing it all. 
This was really, really kind of pushing Office back in the early 90s, when still everything was largely cubes. Office is on the perimeter, workstation's in the middle. So we were already thinking that the workplace could be different. Quirky little companies like Music Buddha. I mean, yeah. a bunch of companies that were newly funded, but the internet had not yet matured. The dot-com was an amazing time, a little, a little too crazy. And a little short. We had no idea that this, this era would come, but I think we were preparing for it. The engineers are now running companies, having this very democratic space. We would have to carefully orchestrate for these engineers and their needs. And we thought we had this great scheme. And oh my god, they had completely they really torn were. all the furniture apart. They made their own and office. And reconfigured everything. And that's what they do. They tinker and they change. They right. basically coded their, coded their offices themselves. Right. But you learn from that. You well, did. I thought we were going to get fired. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> but the big takeaway from that was personalizing your workspace, yep. right? We were kind of trying to push clients in this direction of a little bit more open collaborative space, kind of lowering things. One of our bigger driving ideas for Facebook was that we would create these streets connecting the neighborhoods that were the different departments of Facebook. So at Uber, we created the walk-in conference room. So essentially, you start your meeting at the beginning point, and the idea is that you finish your meeting at the end of this pathway. To really make collaborative office, you need to think of all these things. It's shaping behavior. It's understanding that the workday isn't just about sitting at your desk all day. It's about recharging the batteries. It's about socializing. And how design really pushes that. How does that transform the business? In terms of, especially for recruiting for, for the company, and what it shows, what we're investing into the company and the employees, I think it's a major, major step. One of our amazing clients is, is John Liu, and we started kind of the early days of workplace and tech, all the way through Facebook and now Yelp. Yelp never really actually had a lot of identity for the office. We kind of came up with what is Yelp about in right. the first project. It's got a little bit of a retro look to it and the general store idea general store. started with our first one. I love getting repeat clients like that because you get to hone your design and your ideas and your concepts. Our client have, have just become more and more design savvy as the years have gone on. Yeah. And I, I don't think it's just the Silicon Valley. We're coming back around to design mattering. For a long time, no one wanted to be located between 6th and 9th. And now everybody is coming down here. Mm. So the concept behind Artist Venture is all about the home. The parlor, the living room, the dining room, all these different settings that you'd see in the house, except they're really just meeting spaces. And it makes you want to live here. <laughs> it does. Our team designed this, and we call it the shrimp couch. As I saw in your studio, you're designing all these beautiful patternings that could yeah. be incredible textiles or flooring and then all this custom furniture. Are yeah. you guys going to be doing more of this? Yeah, yeah. I think Prima's really interested in the furniture part. I'm more of a surface girl. I love patterns. These are great. Yep, more pattern. Because there's such an awareness of, of good design, it has just made it that much more important that we kind of look at materials in a different way. We always like the found object in kind of repurposing things. Lots of doors. Lots of doors, lots of different moldings, lots of different eras. How do you create culture when culture is so new to this young emerging company? Well, you pay homage, you kind of understand where you're coming from, so that is looking a little backwards, but then you create space for the way you like to work. So this is very similar to the jewelry case that we did right. at Yelp. To go to these places like Urban Ore, you know, it, you, you may not even know what you're looking for. That's the great thing. You just come upon it. So our finds. I don't care how much this costs. Uh, Yelp, saddle. here we come. The all hands area for the food. We were actually in the same junior high together, we and he had his growth spurt. In I had a mustache grade. in sixth grade. Yeah. <laughs> I was going, a thug. That is a scary looking guy. So when did you start? 
dating? Just before our senior prom. Yeah. We did. It was the mixtape. Somehow, a friend of ours got us to trade tapes. So that's how the courtship started. So we both went to college together. So cute. So I was in the art program. He was in... It was called Engineering Technology. It was about building power plants. After about six months, I was like, Verda's classes look much more interesting than mine. So I moved right into the interiors program. Orlando Diaz would lecture. Andrew Belchner would lecture. I mean, Art Gensler obviously had his practice. What I was interested in was installation, installation art. Installation art. I'd build them, and we'd set them up, and we'd have a week-long show together. We always worked together. I've decided to go to Harvard. My dream, too, was to go to graduate school, but I go, well, we can't both be in grad school. So I said, I'll try to start a firm. <laughs> and that was 25 years ago. This is more or less one of the layouts. These are open meeting spaces. These are more collaborative. I love the conversation right now around workplace. We actually teach a course in workplace design. It's the only master's program in the world, actually. There's gonna be a whole new millennial workforce in the next five years, and they're working differently. And we love teaching people about what some of these ideas are. Look, not just online, look around. Forget Google search. Go take pictures, go walk around. Tell me what spaces make you feel happier or work best. Get this point of view that is outside of this digital world and you will have a much richer project. This is our green corner of the world. Oh, yeah, there's a bluebird. Oh, yeah. yeah. Apollo! <laughs> This house is beautiful, huh? All my friends think my house is like really cool. <laughs> the coolest, <laughs> right? The coolest. It's been a slow build of a general cultural awareness towards design. No one really cared about just 10 years ago. Yeah. And the workplace is important. It's here to stay. We like to carry the flag for a workplace. You're representing. We're representing. Yeah. Yes. We're yes. representing. Yes. really more about lifestyle than the building. Mm -hmm. And I say that a lot, that I'm offering somebody a lifestyle in a place more than architecture. Right. But it turns out to be architecture. But what do you think, Rick? It seems like when you love something, you really, really go beyond. It's like it with most things in life, you have to ask yourself, what do you want first, right? Right. You don't just start making dinner because it's going to look nice. Right. You say, what do I want to feel like right now? You just say what you want to do and try to design to it. Mm. And the form comes later. It supports it. And I love this quote from Yahani Palazma. It comes from one of his writings. It said, Rick, it should be more about the verb than a noun. It's the act of looking through a window or walking through a threshold before you design that window or that threshold. What's the feeling? What's the atmosphere like? Uh, Cindy, it's just right over this hill. This is the Nomad House, yeah. yes? Desert Nomad oh, House. Oh, Desert Nomad. Because there are three elevated boxes in the desert, we did that to protect the roots of the cactus and everything, we had decided to assert the applied skin nature of the building mm. and did this heavy plate steel. Yeah. And they float on the ground. And you're on these concrete posts, right? Yep. 
And then on the inside, it's all clad in maple, like a beautiful jewelry box. And then the roof is a teak deck that's floating above the rubber membrane. Oh, it's teak. Oh, I see. And then you get up on there and sleep at night. That's just great. That's crazy. We call these instruments that frame the views, you mm. know, single aperture instruments, more right. than buildings. It's one house, but you're required to walk on the ground between the rooms to reorient yourself with nature between them. Watch your step and uh, yes. watch out for all the rattlesnakes. Oh. <laughs> that's not fun. <laughs> Growing up in Maine, nature becomes your luxury. Right. Sledding and the trees and no trees and leaves and no leaves and all that stuff just becomes really um, vibrant in your mind and you pay attention to it. And then when I came to Arizona, it was crazy because everything's completely different. You know, I built the first 12 projects myself as the builder. So I built this building and I had a crew of 15 recent architecture school graduates as the construction crew. Wow. This was a fun thing to build. It's kind of a perfect room. Yeah. The sunlight bounces off the north wall in right. here and lights the space. Did you know you were doing something special? You know, I was looking at people's work, of course, Louis Barragan mm. and Zumpta was new on the scene. Sigurd Leverens and Sver Fenn, Norwegian guys, and Johan Utzon. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to do work like those guys. Right. They were my heroes. Having color at all was inspired by Baragon. I was like, you're Baragon, but, but there's no pink. What I found here was letting nature into the space, mm -hmm. letting light into the space, a celestial connection upstairs. Mm -hmm. Those things don't cost much, mm -hmm. but they just add so much atmosphere. Well, all I know is when I stepped through the gates, I was completely transported. <laughs> We built everything new and made a very clear distinction between old and new. Mm. And we built with earth. So the soil in Tucson is perfect for adobe and rammed earth. Right. And then we added a little iron oxide pigment. I see you can that. See. I see You see it every once in a while. It just matches the, the earth perfectly. Built by cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> This is really one of the oldest streets in, the, in North America. This was famous for gunfights and Chinese laundries, but it's really great to still have some of the history intact here. Definitely. Tucson has really beautiful air, and the sunlight's really bright and crisp, and so when you know there's gonna be a shadow, you know it's gonna be a perfectly straight, crisp line. Beautiful diagonals, it's fun right? To, yeah. like... And then the kind of trees that we have are so lacy that mm. the dapple light just falls on everything. And, Light is key. Right. And when I found rammed earth as a material, the most beautiful aspect of rammed earth is when sunlight hits it. Mm. And then it's just these two things dancing together, sort of. When you say you've sort of found rammed earth, what does that mean? Well, there were some projects going on in Tucson, and what the other builders were doing is plastering. Mm. And I just took a look at it, and I said, well, wait, plaster is sand, water, and cement. And why do you have to plaster it? It, it kind of is plaster. It's incredible. The joke is it's dirt cheap. <laughs> it's dirt. <laughs> when you were growing up, were you a precocious little kid? Were you drawing? I was drawing a lot. And I really wanted to play guitar, but that was like 500 bucks. And so I, I took up drums, and I got really good at it. Wow. Uh -huh. And I started just playing out gigs mm. and traveling, playing drums. Um, OK, but so then how did the architecture bug? How did you get there? You know, I was bike racing. And so I was super healthy, unlike all the other musicians at night while we were playing and after yeah. and stuff. I just said, all right, it's time to study architecture. And so I said, I'm going to go as far away as possible. And I'm in Maine, in the woods, and I finally opened up this one package from the University of Arizona, and on the cover was a sunset with a saguaro. And I'm like, <laughs> oh. And so I did it, and Will Bruder recruited me right out of school. And you worked on the library, right? I did all the hand drawings. Freehand, in perspective, I drew the tensegrity roof structure. But I just want to show you how things worked a yeah. little bit back in the day. Yeah. You, but you drew this? Yeah. <gasps> it's incredible. Looks like And art. I actually measured these trees and You did? And... You obsessive. Thank you. <laughs> I love that. And um... They're beautiful. They're still beautiful. All the projects in Arizona are really small. Mm. But what about the Amon? Yeah, then there was a big jump to the Amon, and that was a rugged project. Since the first day I walked the site, it was 12 years until the opening. Wow.
We found this great Octavio Paz poem, Wind, Water, and Sand, and we just used it as our mantra. The place became the, those mesas, the landscape, which are all eroded by wind, water, and sand. And we decided to make a hotel of concrete that was the same coloration of the, and it feels and looks the same. Yeah, it does. So what you see here is all the interiors that we did for the big hotel we're, we're working on down in Mexico. It's big, how big? It's 176 standalone buildings. So there's half the rooms are tree houses. Mm. We designed everything from the little mezcal glasses. Yeah, I see them over there. To Fantastic. all the dishes. It seems like place is almost the beginning of everything for you. Well, and an atmosphere. Mm, there we go. <laughs> This sense of discovery, right? You hold people back yep. so that there's anticipation. How did you figure this out? You know, as a drummer, your job is to really set the tone of the groove, right? right? The feel of the music. Good quality songs are a creation of an atmosphere, right? And it's almost like a, you know, an intro yeah. before the melody starts kind of right. thing, getting you ready. And I actually narrate when I design them. You know, I just say things like, you know, let's go in through this gate. The gate has to squeak a little bit. It's a beautiful, historic wall. It's been here for 100 years, and the ground crunches under your feet. And then the lacy shadows of the tree and the rustling of the leaves and the dripping water from the fountain. And it's all choreographed to be like that. a song. There are times when I feel like the band leader but when there's spatial qualities and complexities and atmospheres involved and narratives and smells and colors and tactical qualities, it's just, it's almost like composing. Can't get enough and ready for more? Our next group of Polar Famers are up. Here we go. This is a project we're doing in Brooklyn. Mm. And this Etsy. is the interiors? This, this is the interiors. interiors. Cindy, I went to see this project. It is going to be amazing. I knew that I wanted to work for a large architectural firm because I had had all these experiences, you know, working for the developer. And when I went to Gensler, there was a woman sitting across the table. It was Margot Grant, and she was running the office. It was sort of like this, wait a minute, I want to do that. Right. You know? I, I want to do that someday. Robin is all about style, elegance, and relevance. She has an innate sense of knowing what is great design right now. In fact, Robin can walk into a room and in five seconds she can tell you what is right about that space and what could have been done a little bit better. I recognize great style. I recognize great design. What I realized was I wasn't necessarily going to be the creator of it. I had a real curiosity to really develop my understanding of the business aspects of our business. So you were employee number what? Employee number 24. Wow. Yeah, it was crazy. Don Brinkman, he used to sit across from me and the two of us used to bum cigarettes from one another. <laughs> and when you walked into the drafting room, there were like clouds of smoke that used to travel <laughs> across the ceiling. Everybody did everything. You did one project a year. <laughs> that was what? What? <laughs> well, I, you were typing specs on three-part yeah, paper. Yeah, yeah. There weren't, you know, the kinds of finishes, the kinds of furniture, this, the sophistication. It was, yeah. It's a different world. It was really, yeah. really different. Robin, she's like a sister to me. We literally grew up at Gensler together. We've seen our firm grow into a global design powerhouse, and it's because of Robin, her leadership, her tenacity, 
for recognizing what great talent's all about and recognizing what great design is all about. Well, welcome to Cadillac House. Wow. All right, so I hear that the Cadillac House is a place where you can't buy a Cadillac. You cannot buy a Cadillac, but you can experience so many other things. It's a different way about thinking about marketing to influence their future customer and mm. build awareness. Yeah. We could not have created a project like this without having a diversity of talent. I think Robin, she's almost like a conductor, you know, it, it's, it's a beautiful blend of perseverance, strength, but a little malleability to make sure that everyone's opinion is heard and valued, and then we're moving on, you know? She's built a toolbox at Gensler where she can move through it and find exactly the tool that she needs to get to where she wants to go. So I am co-leader of the Northeast region in Latin America with my partner, Joe Brancata. Mm. We have offices in Morristown, New Jersey, here in New York, Manhattan, Boston, and our newest office in Toronto. And then we also have our Latin America region where we have an office in Costa Rica, one in Mexico City, and one in Sao Paulo. I've worked with some of the world-class designers. I've worked with Art Gensler. I've worked with Carlos Martinez. I've worked with John Bricker. Can I keep going? Yeah, I've worked yeah, yeah. with Ed Wood. Did I say Mark Morton? It's how she picks her colleagues that surround her. You know, that is part of her enormous talent, not only hiring the right people, but I'll call her up and she'll say to me, uh, oh, I know who's right for that. we put together this team was, let's see, this is a trading company, mm. but they think of themselves as a technology firm. We needed to really hone in on what it meant to be a part of their tribe. All the brand elements, the art elements to help push their culture a bit further. When they walked in the space, I heard that they all went, wow, this is us. That's a successful project. She's such an incredible mentor and coach to so many designers in our firm. Robin makes you bring, you know, the best of yourself to every moment, every interaction. It's kind of like a family around a dinner table. They're tough debates and they're tough conversations, but at the end of dinner, yeah. we're still, you know, we're moving forward in lockstep. taken this firm, I believe, to a place that maybe the founders hadn't even imagined. We're over a billion dollars in revenue. Last year, we designed over a billion square feet. We all see Robin today, and she is a force in our industry. But she also came from humble roots, and she's never forgotten that it's important to give back. I am the child of immigrants, and my parents um, one of the things that they instilled in, the, in my brothers and I is that we needed to be grateful that we had these opportunities and somehow we had to pay it forward. We've given over a million dollars in scholarships to kids who would have never had an opportunity in architecture and design. I am very, very intent about our next generation of leaders in the firm. We have an incredible group of people what they're going to achieve, what they're going to achieve with the tools that we have. The amount of lives she's touched. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of people who are living in spaces that she imagined with her team. She's so damn smart and so damn intuitive. And she recognizes incredible talent. I don't really think Robin is a product of Gensler. Gensler and its success is really a product of the influence of Robin on all of us. It's not that the world stops when you exit. It's about what happens after you. Most important to me is my legacy. And, and what do you want that to look like? I'm very, very optimistic. We're in really, really good hands. One, two, three, roll! <laughs> We're in really good hands with really incredible people. And that is, to me, the most important thing.
I often get asked how I design resorts of the scale I design them. And it's the same way you eat an elephant, you know, one bite at a time. Roger has shown over and over again his ability to marry color, scale, form, shape, in fanciful ways. Design for me is opportunity. It's an opportunity to create something new and never seen before that connects directly to my soul. And it's joyous. It's absolutely the most joyous thing I do is that sheer positive motion of creation. There's nothing better. In Las Vegas, in the city where you think of shag carpeting and, and flocked wallpaper, I grew up curled in an Eero Saarinen womb chair in the corner of a living room with Florence Knoll sofas and Nakashima tables. My mother always made sure that the newest art books were delivered to the house. Wow. And so I began a really early dialogue about what was important in art and what was important in design. Hi, Roger. Oh, oh my so God, big. this house is stunning. Thank you. Come on. Mark Mack, great architect. Wow. So it's all built around a courtyard, and everything we look at is something that Mark Mack created and that With I decorated. You. Yes, that you decorated. And that I decorated. Yes. It's an 18th century Berber ceiling acquired by Luciano Tempo. So this chair is by Gerd Rickveld. I think they feel like they were discovered archeologically. Yeah. And I just love your vignettes. Thank you. And what things that you love. Yes. Yeah. I circumnavigate the globe at least twice a year. Uh, one of my jobs is to find things that, that no one else gets to see. So I always include a bit of once upon a time in my projects. I'm always looking for some star quality piece made long ago. I was in what I called Andy's Army yeah, with so Andy Warhol. So cool. I think if you're going to have a portrait done, it should be done nowhere past your 30s. <laughs> What I did really well didn't have much currency with my peer group in the 50s and 60s. I drew really well, I painted well, I could imagine well, I could uh, build things and I was good with my hands and I thought all of that made me weird. When I graduated, from college and I came home to start in interior design, I was a Miesian. Anything before Mies van der Rohe was useless. <laughs> uh, and I proceeded in a career of designing financial institutions, mostly for the family. Yeah, I think, that, I think this building's beautiful, actually. I haven't been in this building in 20 years. Yeah, I'm sure you don't see it the same way. My father started the first bank to lend money to the casino industry. I was worth $25,000 when I met his dad. And his dad put his arm around me and decided that Las Vegas needed young people. I was 25. Steve had lost his father about two years before meeting my father, and my father kind of stepped into mm -hmm. those shoes. And Steve stepped into the role of oldest brother in our family. I was his brother. <laughs> it was a family affair. <laughs> Oh my God. The history of Las Vegas. Wow. The old Horseshoe Club downtown, Terrible Herbst. The very first casino I designed yeah. and helped with this logo, the Lady Luck. Oh my God. The early architecture of Las Vegas was based on buildings meant to hold signs. So this is literally the early architecture and design of the outside of Las Vegas. All right, let's keep going. Let's dig deeper. But there's a little peekaboo of the stardust. I thought every child in the world right. went to see Frank Sinatra. <laughs> and the marquee for the Golden Nugget, where the win history started. I always tried to say we were going to marry showmanship with good taste. We were going to turn glitz into ritz. I just made that ridiculous <laughs> rhyme up. But the idea was that we could be tasteful and keep the promise of Las Vegas to live large. My career with Steve started designing some rooms for Victoria Bay. It was like Michelangelo getting into the garden at the Medici Palace. 
I was about to get the patron of all patrons. The history of Las Vegas changed when Steve Wynn built the Mirage, and I got to be part of that. The largest hotel in Las Vegas before the Mirage was, I think the actual number is 250, and the Mirage is 2,500 rooms, so it increased the game by tenfold. Game changing for cool. gaming, right? Game changing <laughs> for gaming. It's one thing to do an apartment, the lobby of an office building, or even a large residence of 20 or 30,000 square feet. It's quite a different thing to do six million square feet. These hotels are designed tour de forces. Okay, this is a total wow. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly what we wanted it to yes. be. They have their own swimming pools, their own beauty salon. Talk about an oasis, right? The attention to detail to everything is what you do so splendidly, it's right? It's what we love to do. Yes, yes. Steve always has a big idea for when Las Vegas was, I want to see a place that no one has ever seen before. Uh, for Wynn Palace Kotai, it was Honor China. The entire casino of the hotel was inspired by the teacup of the last emperor. I can say, Roger, let's do this restaurant with this sensibility, this feeling. His style is to go away for two days. And then he'll come back and voila, there'll be five choices. These are sketchbooks that I carry with me worldwide. I'm always uh, drawing. Any idea I have, I draw. And then just ideas that might go into carpets or ceilings yeah. or wall covering. When you design 20 or 30 million square feet, most of it's custom, and you manufacture all of it, you end up with a great vocabulary uh, of how to build all of those things. Hurl it! <laughs> I now get to design everything from two and a half million square foot casino resorts to a watch. It's, it's the best, and it all tastes like dessert. Right. <laughs> this is my reinterpretation of chinoiserie for the 21st century. And in these rooms, I design the china mm. as well as all of the linens. So you can see that the and china and linens match. I like golden light rooms to act like a glass of champagne. Mm. They should be effervescent. Yeah. I want to create interiors for the most sophisticated person in the world, and I want them to be comfortable. In any room I create, whether you're in a tuxedo or a t-shirt, you should feel absolutely appropriate. It's your room. At the end of the day, Roger designs and gives me choices. Pick a card, Steve. If in doubt, just gold leaf it. It always works. <laughs> It's not about having big spaces, it's about having large spaces that feel small and intimate and personal. What I found most amazing is that I've had one client for 35 years. Whatever success we've enjoyed is inextricably bound to his taste and his creativity. My role in this has been that I managed to corral him to do it. You really change things with when. We change them together. Yeah. He has changed the way the world sees not only casino hotel resorts, but hotels. Uh, and I've been able to be a part of that. Roger is a very unusual combination that is for a developer or a client a dream come true. I was born in Vienna, 1926. Followed the great inflation, and uh, nobody had any money. 
I was able to go to art school and study, and, and at night I was able to go to the concert hall. The good things were, were the music and the music. <laughs> At the time I started this work, there were not that many materials available. Masonry materials were all I had, and I did a lot of stone carving out of pieces of Vienna ruins that resulted from the bombing raids. We had a lot of stone. I had all these photographs of these projects that I did in Vienna. And then I applied for a Fulbright industrial design. And I came to this country, to Rhode Island School of Design for the first year. And that's where I was pointed in some directions where I made good contacts. And MoMA was one of them. I was prominently published and widely. That's when a fellow Viennese wanted to produce and market my screens. That was in 1956. By that time, I had come to Yale. At Yale, I met Joseph Albers. It was strange that I had never really heard much about the Bauhaus while I was in Europe. I had to come to this country to become aware of it. <laughs> The philosophy was you design things as you do them. You don't do a pencil sketch and ask somebody else to do it, for which I had a great affinity. Albers invited me to spend a year as a special student. He said, we could learn a few more things here. <laughs> and, and I did. And then he appointed me to a faculty position. Some people saw my work as reflecting that preoccupation with the organic shape and the organic curve. It was used from in very small scale, for instance, for this small office, for Look magazine. And then we did it in an eight-inch scale, and that's what Noel used in the bank in Miami, First National Bank in the airport in Montreal, Dorval, in 8-inch scale, for some larger exterior architectural installations. The 12-inch scale was more appropriate, and the Vassar College is done in that scale by Paul Schweiker, Welton Beckett, 1964, New York World's Fair. There he did the Coca-Cola Pavilion. It's adorned by one of my screens. Some of my license to do repeat patterns, I think comes from the continuo in Baroque music, which is the recycling of a theme. The essence of the composition is interwoven with it, but the continuo is what supports that structure. If you tell me I have an, an idea, a concept, I might ask you, what shape does it have? When you look at, at the potato chip, it sits on the surface with the opposite points are pointing up. It rocks, and that's a saddle shape that everyone is familiar with. I investigated what would happen if I joined the saddle surface by its own replica, edge to edge, and eventually it turned out that in one sense it was close on itself, but on the other's end it would escape into the distance again. One thing that I thought is extremely important in sculpture is the concept of space-time. There is an element of time in anything three-dimensional. Something has to change in significant ways when you change your vantage point in space. When you merely move any three-dimensional uh, object, that may not be enough in some cases. It's the difference between noise and music. 
you want something that transcends the merely visible and most people who see this item here don't see any of these shapes. But what you have to do is suspend what you think you know and be receptive to what comes in through the eye. Design one that was originally made is two components, two handles that would meet here and between them they would create this interior space that is bounded by saddle shapes only. In this case, the light brings out certain features that from other lighting and directional vantage points, the horizontal line. From here, you might think that's an edge on the surface. And when you put several models together, new features appear that go way beyond the local here, and those are big circles that are composites of a number of modules. I try to educate kinetic viewers, not teach kinetic sculpture, but it's the viewer who has to do the moving where the sculpture doesn't do it, but movement has to occur. Some students are talented, some students are personable, and some people are both, and Rick was one of those. Erwin would tell me about these dreams of these thin pieces um, of taking these designs and making this change. But he knew if he did it the old-fashioned way, it could be two years to make that subtle change. So I said, well, computers should be able to do it. <laughs> we decided to digitize some of the older designs and the material we are using for that is medium-density fiberboard. This is our first digital version of what design one used to be. As the first attempt where we actually reduced the depth in space, but at the same time, I was dreaming, and I'm still dreaming, of expanding it in space. When it turned out that the MDF material has certain limitations, it's fragile in a way. The old work became attractive again. Most of it is done with cast stone. That's why I'm now remastering the old designs, and we do now about 50-50% business with both mm -hmm. ways. Most that have contacted us and most interior designers, they're familiar with the checkoff box. Someone has already done all the work. Our principal fabricator, we come up with the term of uh, unobtainium. That's the material that everyone is specifying. <laughs> that it's thin as this and it's light as that and it can be made in infinite dimensions and it's absolutely regular, doesn't shrink, doesn't crack, doesn't warp. How do you describe yourself? What are you? Where's Beethoven when you need him? <laughs> I'm not a literary person. Engineering is something that interests me a lot. You described yourself as what you are not. What are you? I'm a sculptor. Da, 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 da. Uh. <laughs> that was Beethoven. <laughs> So my friends, there you have it, an amazing week of design inspiration, but it's not over. Tune in next week for another full week of design, design, design. I know, I can't get enough. I'm Cindy Allen, Editor-in-Chief of Interior Design. See you Monday for Best of Year. <laughs>